Bedroom Canyon community. Thank you so much for having me. I am humbled and honored to be here. When I was thinking about doing this talk today, I thought about Ava DuVernay, who's an amazing filmmaker, and she recently got an award. And what she said just stopped me in my tracks and made me think about talking to you today. What she says, she had said was, uh, do not give me a chair at the table. Do not give me three or even half the chairs at the table. I want a new table made in my likeness and in the likeness of those before me who were forced out of the room. Now, when she says that, the chair or in more, more common terms, having a seat at the table, what she's talking about is actually being involved with the decisions, whether it's the creative realm where she's a filmmaker, it's the spiritual realm as far as establishing um, religions and standards like that. It's the business realm where you're in the boardroom or in the, um, the cultural realm where you're deciding what we're going to listen to or what we're going to eat. All those things have an impact on our society. Now, I thought about y'all when I heard this quote because she started doing her filmmaking in her 30s as a side hustle, as a side hustle. Now she's just a little bit older, maybe a little bit younger than me. And so for about a decade or so, she's been able to do, I don't know, 12, 13 movies. From the movie 13 about the jail system to When They See Us, about the Exonerated Five over in um, Central Park. Like amazing, amazing stuff. She's made this big impact in the world. And it started, started as a side hustle when she was in her 30s. It resonates with me personally because that's also my journey. My background is journalism. I used to write a lot for the major newspapers and a lot of the major magazines like Playboy and the New York Post and those guys. But then I started doing side hustles and that turned me into a best-selling author multiple times. That turned me into a successful public speaker, speaking at TED and other, other conferences. It also turned me into a, um, a bootstrapping entrepreneur and my second company, Cuddler, got really popular and actually got acquired by another company. But all those came from side hustles. If it wasn't for those side hustles, I would not be having this moment with you right now. Side hustles have the ability to have you transform yourself, your community, and maybe even the world. But before you get that far though, you have to be able to learn how to harness the power of the side hustle. It's not just like you start something on the side and then it miraculously becomes this successful thing. As they say, there are levels to this. And I've found that it's three major tenets that if you remember them, you'll be able to have success with your business. The first one is to be a proud side hustler. Sounds kind of unusual because I imagine you and, and, and many of you that are listening right now are proud. But I mean, to be proud of being a side hustler with that part of your identity. And we'll get into that. Number one, be a proud side hustler. Number two is to remember your priority. Not priorities, priority, as in one, one thing. Just one thing that's important in your life and as a consequence in your business as you build it. And number three, which is my personal favorite, remembering your worth, even when other people don't understand your vision. Remembering your worth, even when other people don't understand your vision. So that's the one, two, three. So let's get started. Being proud as a side hustler really is an inside job. But you can get insight from that from, from all around you. I have a friend and colleague named uh, Chris Gillenbaugh. He did a book called Side Hustle, literally the name of the book. It came out around the same time, maybe right before my own book, The Bite Says Entrepreneur, which is also about side hustles. We both had bestsellers. We both were cool. And I was supporting him over in, um, over in Detroit when he was having a launch party there. And you know, you have the launch party, you have the, the book signing, you have someone doing a keynote, you know, you have the mingling afterwards. I was mingling afterwards. I ran into a, a guy that was from Michigan. So he was a local guy. And he said, Damon, when I listened to Chris and then I'm talking to you now, I, I thought that I was the first side hustler in my family. I thought I was starting from scratch. And then I remember my uncle Vinny and he was really good with cars. like. He could have been an engineer, a mechanic on a higher level. He could have been designing the cars over in Detroit. And then I think about my Aunt Betty, who was a marvelous cook, a baker, in fact, who baked cakes and things like that. 
They were getting money and doing things all in the neighborhood. They helped support the neighborhood that I grew up in. However, no one actually said, hey, Uncle Vinny owns a business. Or no one said, hey, Uncle Vinny has a side hustle. They just said, hey, you got car issues? <clears throat> I know a guy, a guy named Vinny down the street. He'll hook you up. It'll be a fair price. He'll get you going by the end of the day, I promise. Hey, you, your daughter's... Your daughter's getting married or you know you're, you're having like a, a high school graduation for her you know auntie betty down the street she'll hook you up you know she'll give you a beautiful cake no problem it's this weekend i'm sure she'll can handle it this was part of the community his family was part of the fabric of the community if you think about your own community you're probably surrounded by side hustlers particularly back in the day if you think about the past the thing was i'm a business coach i've done three ted talks I've done a bunch of conversations and, and at this post, point, talked to thousands of people who are starting their own business or trying to pivot their business into a side hustle or whatever. And it didn't dawn on me that I wasn't the one of one, as we say nowadays. I thought I was breaking some type of generational curse, you know, where it's like, oh, well, Damon's going to become an entrepreneur. Damon's going to create, you know, I'm going to go ahead and... and um, be the first of my of my family to not work for other people, that kind of thing. And then after I talked to the guy at the at the launch in Detroit, I, I realized that was rubbish. My pop, who's the one who raised me, he was one of the first, if not the only, African American um, mortgage brokers in the Midwest, in the city that we lived in, back in Lansing, Michigan. Right now, I was aware of that, but I didn't put it together. Even worse. My uncle, Uncle George, my favorite uncle, he's based in Camden, New Jersey, which is where my mom's side of the family is originally from. He started not only his own tire shop, which was, I believe, the only major African-American owned tire shop, you know, and he started that shortly after I was born. So back in the 70s. But not only that, but he actually started a, a roving carnival that during the summer seasons, when you go to, you know, um, have a state fair or when the church has an event or whatever, he brings the carnival rides. He was doing that for decades. But even more embarrassing, further back, my father's father, my grandfather, who died probably about 15 years ago, he actually owned um, bars all through Camden. And I believe also in Raleigh, Durham, which is where my pop side of the family is originally from. Not only that, but he also owned repair shops for cars and for trucks. The key thing for my grandfather, though, is that they were catering, or he was catering more specifically, to the African-American community. He would be, uh, if he was alive, he'd be like 90 right now or so. So you think about when he's like in his 20s or 30s, he's doing these startups, which was a word that didn't exist back then. He's doing these startups along with perhaps his main job, which turned those into side hustles. His people, our people, couldn't go into those other bars. We couldn't get, get the repairs done in other places for fear of having, you know, price gouging or other issues. My whole point is that the side hustle thing isn't necessarily new, particularly if, like me, your family are immigrants or you're part of the BIPOC, as they say nowadays, the Black, Indigenous, or People of Color communities. If you're part of the LGBTQ community, which is a whole different discussion. We didn't necessarily have access to those things. But at the same time, even though I grew up in a household where both my, both my parents are from the inner city, so they grew up poor, inner city poor, but they both had college degrees, very intelligent people. We didn't use the term entrepreneur in my house when I was growing up. We used all these other terms, but we didn't use the term entrepreneur. That was a, a French term. And no one said side hustle. I'm not sure if that term existed when I was growing up. But people around me were doing it all the time. This is why I say you need to take pride and take assessment in all this lineage. It might be DNA. It might be the people that surround you. It might be the people that helped you grow up. There are hustlers all around you. You just might not see them. And more importantly, they might not recognize that they're hustlers. I have people that I care about that are hustlers to the core. And I mean that in the most positive sense as far as being side hustlers. And you ask them they're a side hustler, they're like, nope. So you have to be able to recognize them so you can get their support and get some of their game, even if they don't necessarily understand that they're side hustling.
when you take pride in being a side hustler, then you start to see the patterns and the lineage of the side hustlers that you come from. Along that note, you might be feeling, as other people are, that you have to scramble and figure things out. But if you can identify with what I'm talking about, then you're actually ahead of the curve. It's not just a semantic thing. And again, my background is journalism, so I love semantics. But it's not a, a wordplay thing as far as they're not being side hustlers or entrepreneur not really you know, becoming popular in the American language um, until the last 20 years. It's not just the wordage. For our different communities, it was also because it wasn't a choice. Side hustle wasn't a cute thing that you did, right? My grandfather set up bars to help pay for and take care of my grandmother and you know my pop and his sister, my aunt, right? My uncle went ahead and did those things to provide for his large family and to, to be a North Star for me. Let's not even get into that as his nephew. There wasn't that thing where it's like, this is a cute idea, I'm just going to do it. There's a few factors behind that. If you're part of the minority community from the Jim Crow laws and the manifestations of that now, which again is another keynote, to the Lavender laws who have put, who have put limitations on the LGBTQ community, we've actually legally been capped as far as how much wealth we can create generationally and just for our family. And so if you're in that situation, then of course you're gonna be a number runner, which I have some in my family. Of course you're gonna create your own business. Of course you're gonna to cater to people in the community who have been neglected because the majority doesn't wanna take care of them. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and this is where you get involved, is that this was the case until the elephant in the room, the pandemic. Now it's 2020. Now the, um, the unemployment rate is higher, I believe, than it was during the Great Depression exactly 100 years ago, almost to the day. Now people who had the option of getting the gold watch after working at a, a, a good job for 60 years, now they don't have that option. Now side hustles aren't cute. Now side hustles are a necessity. People are just trying to get by. The thing is, the people who are underserved, the people who um, are overlooked, the people in some cases who have been legally repressed, they are actually ahead of the curve now. If you identify with that, you are actually ahead of the curve. So don't worry about running around trying to figure things out and panicking. No, 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 no. If you understand your history, hustle might be in your DNA. If you already started this side hustle, particularly before the pandemic had it happened, you're ahead of the curve of all the other folks who are trying to figure it out. You know that it's not a cute thing. You know this is part of your wealth building. You know this is part of your perhaps passive income. You know this is part of your creation, you uplifting yourself, your community. You know all that. So honor that. Again, take pride in that. The last level of taking pride in it is understand that you, you have the ultimate job security when you create a side hustle. There's quite a few reasons for that. Number one, you're not waiting for someone to empower you. You're not going to work every day, which is cool if you go to work every day, but you're not going to work every day and then waiting for someone to crown you. This is a magic wand to crown you and be like, hey, you're blessed now. Here's a raise. You're blessed now. You're VP of sales now. You're blessed now. You can take that vacation. As soon as you start to do your side hustles, then they become a way to empower yourself. No one told you to start a side hustle. That's probably my favorite part about it, to be honest, on a personal level. No one tells you to start a side hustle. You know, your mom or whomever is not going to be like, you need to start a side hustle. That's never going to happen. It has to come from within. Now your motivation for it, that could be all over the place. It depends on what you want. But your reason for actually starting it and feeling like you have to start it, no one's gonna make you start a side hustle. So it's like the ultimate empowerment. Kind of back, back to what Ava was talking about. You're not waiting 
as I say in, in Bring Your Worth, my latest book, you're not waiting for anybody else's permission. That's a beautiful thing. And that's a powerful thing, particularly with the direction where we're going right now. Another level as far as with taking pride in it is that you are able to create your own tribe, which is something you cannot do in most cases with your day job. For instance, there's people that I know and respect and love that work at McDonald's. They could be the absolute best cashier in the world, which would be amazing. But when they're getting to those levels, what, who are they building the brand for? Are they building their own tribe? No, they're building a tribe for Ray Kroc and from, for the McDonald's brothers, the people who founded McDonald's and expanded it. Rest in peace to them. But that's who they're, that's who they're bigging up. That's who they're giving strength to. When you do a side hustle, even if it's with affiliation with another company, it's still your name on the door. It's still your creation. It's still your thing, which is fantastic. The last reason why you should absolutely take pride and being a side hustler is you have the ability to create and then have it create for you later. You have the ability to create and have it create for you later. In other words, as you build your networks, as you build uh, your communities, as you build your, um, your reputation and all those other details, then it starts to pay you back. And we'll get into that more with the third thing I was talking about as far as understanding and bringing your worth. So number one, so important. Take pride in being a side hustler. Not something to be ashamed of. Not you go to work and you sneak out and you're, you're sulking because you have to do other things. No, no, it's quite the opposite. You actually have more job security than other people because you don't have your eggs in one basket. Furthermore, you're empowering your community because you're showing that there's different ways, different types of ways to hustle, different types of ways to create. You do not need to, to wait for the approval of someone to go and move forward with that. So that's number one. Number two is to make sure that you understand your one priority, that one thing that you are building your life around. Stephen Covey is a, a really popular author and a consultant. He passed away a handful of years ago, but while he was here on earth, he was an amazing guy. His books from First Things First to other ones that are it's too countless to mention have made an amazing impact on the different things that we've done. And my biggest impact with him was one analogy that he used to talk about priorities. He talks about being on the beach, and I'm from Atlantic City originally, so I can visualize it. And you have a jar. You have a jar and it's filled with pebbles, so tiny rocks, and it's filled with gigantic rocks. You know, like not boulders, but really big stuff. You empty it all out. You wanna fill it back up, so you put all the small rocks in there, little tiny pebbles. Cool, they're in there. And then you go and put the big rocks in and they're not budging. The little rocks, the pebbles won't let it in. They take up all the space, they got, they're all tight, they're not moving, you can push, and they just seem to push back. Pure physics, right? But if you empty out again, you put your big rocks in there, and then you pour your small pebbles in there, they will just fill out perfectly. They'll take up all the extra space, they'll find the nooks and crannies in between the big rocks, and you're back to square one and everything fits. Of course, like I said, it's not really about the rocks, but the rocks symbolizing your priorities. If you're able to focus on your big thing, that big thing that matters to you most, and you make sure that's taken care of, then all little stuff seems to work itself out. But if you focus on the little stuff, it's really easy to get distracted and suddenly your big rocks don't fit anymore. That big rock could be your health, it could be your family, could be your life. That's why side hustles are so powerful because it allows you to build up those things over time versus having a big idea, a side hustle, be a big rock and suddenly you're not able to maneuver around of the things that you actually need to function or to thrive or that are important in your life. I discovered this several years ago. I became an entrepreneur at the exact same time that my wife went back to work after maternity leave and I became the primary caretaker of our four month old son. Now this had been on the books for a little while. I've been wanting to be a father forever. That's, you know, I, I love 
being a father and luckily it's as great as I thought it would be, even better. But as you know, if you're a parent or if you're a guardian, there's zero preparation you could do to actually have a, a screaming baby and you have no idea what's going on with it. I don't care what you read. It's like support you have, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's kind of crazy. It was also crazy to come up with this idea and become an entrepreneur at the exact same time. And I came up with an idea called So Quotable, which allowed you to capture people's quotes. If we're having a conversation, I can capture your quote and share it with other people. Really simple idea. Obviously, I have a journalism background, so that was part of the energy with that, I'm sure. My point is that they hit at the same time. And as the adage says, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. And so they got done. The thing was, is that I knew then and I knew before then that being there for my family and being the primary caretaker was my big rock. As far as I could tell, you know, as, as long as they needed me, I, I guess I'd put it like that. And so everything would have to work around that. Would have to work around him. And so every day he'd wake up at 6 a.m. on the dot. Not 5.59, not 6.01. I am not exaggerating. 6 o'clock, a little, little electric light comes on at 6 a.m. He's up screaming, asking for mommy and daddy. My wife would go to work about an hour later. She would get home around 6 p.m. and that's when she would get settled. So do the math around 11, 12 hours. It's just me and little man. That's it. You know, and our family was, was fairly far away. So it's not like I had extra support like that. So it was just me and him, which worked out well, except I needed to make sure that I took care of my business and still handled my stuff. And so I had to go out and find a way to build this startup and continue to write because I was still a writer within this time frame. So I started waking, waking up at 5 a.m. 5 a.m., cool. I am not a morning person, but it's okay. I shifted 5 a.m. And especially if you're not a morning person, you're groggy when you first start. And you're like, okay. So I wasn't really getting much done because by the time I got started, he'd be waking up. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'll push it to four. Now, there's a, a term in psychology called flow. And if you're getting into work and you're just waking up, it takes you like a half an hour, 45 minutes to kind of see my shoulders kind of muscle in, get some flow going. And it, by the time that started, I'd have maybe an hour of really good work. So you guessed it, move it back even further. 3.15 a.m. This is the deal. So give me 45 minutes to get out of my grog maybe take a shower if I was lucky, and then get into the flow, and that'll give me two hours of solid work. I did that every day for about five months from that, uh, from that fall of 2013 going into the spring of 2014. I actually ended up creating my app, launching it. It got a cult following. It got the attention of Ted. Ted asked me to do a TED Talk. I did a TED Talk the week after the app came out the TED Talk and the app got, a t got the attention of a friend of a friend. They, my friend, my friend of a friend, as well as his friend, were working on an app called Cuddler, which connected people for hugs. This is 2014, so this is, this is the era of, of, um, of Grindr and the era of uh, Tinder and all those, all those where you swipe right or swipe left. We wanna do a platonic version of that. Now, I was a regular writer for Playboy. Um, I did books about the history of sexuality. Like, so this was right up my alley as far as the research I was doing and the impact I wanted to make. And so, yeah, so I ended up coming on board as a co-founder. We launched it shortly after my son's first birthday. It became the number one app in several countries. We had a quarter million users at our peak. We were on the cover of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. It was insane. As I mentioned, this was still happening while I was changing diapers. I think I did the interview with the Wall Street Journal while I was changing my son's diaper. Because at that time he was about one and a half. Yeah, it was, it was real. But shortly after his second birthday, we started getting these phone calls and we were being asked to be acquired. And after some negotiation with a few different companies, we did sell our company. About 11 months after we started that, you know. So we ended up selling it that summer of 2015. Again, shortly after my son's second birthday. We bootstrapped the whole thing. That means we had no outside investment. And so we split up the bounty. 
the day that I, that I and we were going to get paid, I remember my wife had a day off, or it was a Saturday or something. So she was she she was around, and she she was in the kitchen, I think, making something for our son. I was at the kitchen table, which a lot of side hustlers understand. You might have an office somewhere, even off campus, away from your house, but the kitchen table is really where the work gets done. I'm at the kitchen table, and I know the money's supposed to come through, and I just want to kind of because I'm not getting a physical check; it's just a digital trans transfer. So I'm refreshing it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And then I refresh it and it's there, it hits. And I'm like, honey, it's done. And she said, congratulations. I said, thank you. So what do you think we should do for dinner? And that was it. My two year journey with these two apps was done. Not only these two apps, but two TED Talks. I think I wrote a book during that period of time. It was like in a, a really productive period of time. But the thing is, and why I'm sharing this story, is that I was there for my son every single day. In fact, at that point, we, were, we found out we were having another son coming as well. And so, so much stuff going on. The thing is, is that what would have happened if I didn't have my rocks in order? What would happen if before I started the journey, I didn't say, my son, my kids, my family is going to be the priority. What would have happened? A lot can go to your head. A lot can go to your head. And success comes usually when you're not expecting it. And so you gotta be ready for that. You keep saying you want it, you have to make sure that you're ready for that. In my book, uh, The Ultimate Bite Says Entrepreneur, which talks about side hustles and, and talks about my journey and, and the systems and, and the challenges that come with side hustles, I have a chapter in there called, um, uh, you always have to come home. What I mean by that is you eventually have to come back to the life that, you, that you, you're leading, no matter how much business or cultural success you have. I mean, I, I pretty much had the pinnacle, right? I launched the app, bootstrapped it, did a TED talk, two TED talks around it, you know, put it together, we sold it. We're on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Like, what, what else could I ask from that experience? And at the same time, from when I started my journey to when that part of the journey ended, my son, I went from age four months old to just over two. Imagine if I wasn't present for that. Imagine if I didn't have those priorities together. That's why I say you always have to come home no matter what success you have. That's why you gotta have your priorities together. If you're praying or you're meditating or you're focused on success, you better be ready for that success as far as knowing what you want to actually focus on. What is your priority? Side hustles come into play with this because that's why I recommend with all the people that I've coached, I always recommend don't bet it all on black. Don't run away to the proverbial circus. Do not quit your day job until your side hustle is stable. And I mean really stable and you got some money tucked away. Don't do that. Don't do that. There are very few exceptions to where I would say, do that. You, this is not the direction that you want to go in. Because if you end up shifting the power dynamic with that, then suddenly your priorities can get way out of whack. And if Cuddler, So Quotable, which was my first app, or getting money from public speaking or whatever, end up being just the thing, and that became a priority, they want to miss this opportunity to actually grow and enjoy the time with my son. If you have your rocks together, then you have this opportunity to build more. The thing is, is that if you have your priorities together, then you have to do something else, which I think is the most important thing. You have to stretch your timeline. Stretch your timeline. I've gotten to the point now where I've talked to thousands of people, I've coached hundreds of people, I've done um, discussions and interviews all around the world at this point. The biggest challenge isn't that people like yourself, people like me, don't have enough resources and we can't achieve what we want. Our problem is that we can't achieve what we want in the timeline that we want. Again, let me repeat that. The issue usually isn't we don't have the resources we need to get what we want. We usually don't have the resources to get where we want in the timeline that we want. So if you end up stretching a timeline, there's being a lot of different benefits to it. 
The first thing is that you're able to avoid burnout. So you're able to create at a pace that fits your lifestyle versus pushing yourself way too hard. When I lived in Silicon Valley uh, about 10 years ago, I spent some time there. I did a lot of reporting there. That was before I became an entrepreneur. And there were a lot of young guys, usually guys, and young, I'd say 22, 23, who would come up with a new app idea, just like I did, come up with a new app idea, and then down some rock of rock, <laughs> vodka and Red Bulls, or drinking the Red Mountain Dew, which I forget the name of the brand on that, and just guzzle those and try to get the app done within 72 hours. I am not exaggerating. Look at my face. I'm not kidding at all. Like, I, I, I remember their faces. I remember these people. And almost inevitably, they ended up burning out. I knew some people that, that never came back. They, like, were so burnt out because they were going too hard. They weren't looking at it as a side hustle. They were looking at it as, I'm going to create this app. It's going to get really big, and I'm going to sell it for millions of dollars to Google or Facebook or whomever was hot at the time. Instead, if you look at it as a side hustle, then you can build your timeline out. I know with Cuddler, like I said, or with uh, So Quotable, my first app, my first business, it took me five months to get out there from beginning to, to when it was available in the App Store. I know my colleagues and my friends who didn't have a family, but who are similarly skilled, probably could have done it in five weeks. My really skilled friends and the people that I knew who were technically proficient and had launched apps before, probably could have did it in five days. But I had to accept that truth that I had this big rock and I wouldn't have it any other way. And so I'm like, okay, if this is my big rock, these are going to have to be little pebbles. The funny thing is with the acquisition, with the fame that came with it, with the best selling books and so forth, I was able to reach those levels doing it my way, focused on my priority versus me getting distracted from these other things, which ended up burning out a lot of people that I knew at the time. So if you're stretching your timeline and you're feeling this pressure, I have to do this by age 40, you might want to double or triple that timeline and just, just try to relax into it. The side hustle is going to build exactly how it's going to build. On that note, if you end up stretching the timeline, you also give yourself a chance to really think about your resources and how you're using them. I'm in the same circle through TED mostly, but through other things, in the same circle as millionaires and billionaires and people who have, who have made their money. The challenging thing with having a lot of money is that you can sometimes think it's the answer. You know, as the analogy says, if you, if, if, you, if, you, if you have a hammer, then you think everything is a nail. In other words, whatever's in your toolbox, that's going to color how you end up approaching things. And so if you have a ton of money and your idea or your side hustle or whatever isn't working out, then it's tempting to just throw money at it. When it could be an issue with, as they say in the startup world, your product market fit. In other words, you're not giving what your customer actually needs, right? But if you keep throwing money at it, you think it's going to get fixed, but there's really a systemic problem, as they say, that's an issue with it. Same thing with time. Again, the young guys that, that I saw back in the day in Silicon Valley, they had plenty of time and they had plenty of energy because they were young. So they went in and did it and then ended up burning themselves out and not actually pausing to think and say, wait, is this maximizing my resources? Is this the best approach to take? When you stretch your timeline, you also give an opportunity for your idea and your side hustle to actually grow, which is crucial. I know that when we were working on Cuddler, my main thing, I was essentially the COO and the uh, CMO, so the chief marketing officer. We didn't have titles, but that, that kind of fit the description. And so I was in charge of the launch. We could have launched four to six weeks ahead of that. We, la we launched in the beginning of the fall. We could have launched in the summer. But there were certain details that I wanted to get more info on. So we spent a little bit more time working with the beta testers, who are the people who test the product. Working with them, getting feedback from them. We kept going over the details. Uh, we kept reading the literature as far as how Tr Tinder and Grindr and other competitors were, were successful and kept getting those details together. Those certain details that end up making us a success happen at the 11th hour. And you know, like within those few weeks that we added 
added to it when we could have launched and we waited, ended up being a whole different level of success that we found. And those details kept, you know, made the difference between being a pretty good app, which would have gotten some buzz, to a phenomenal app that ended up being the most popular of that year and the acquisition, of course. But that came from stretching the timeline and actually giving us that energy and that momentum, not only us, but for the idea itself and giving it time to gestate, which I think is crucial to that. Lastly, as far as having your priority together, if you can't go fast, then you have to go consistently. And consistency is key. If, if you don't remember anything else from this keynote, remember that you can't go fast. Consistency is really the key thing. Consistency is the thing. As I said in, in a recent column that I wrote for Inc., you going fast and trying to rush it and build a community and go like this and that, that's the equivalent of you know turning a, an oven to 700 and expecting the cookies to bake twice as fast. It just doesn't work like that. Consistency is the main thing that you end up getting from it, and that's what makes it beautiful. I call it my idea of, um, of uh, compound interest of effort. If you're familiar with compound interest, if you end up having a dollar and you put it into the bank, you put it into the credit union, and within that period of time, they give you 5% interest, then over that period, and you, you leave your money alone, then you have a dollar and five cents, right? If you keep that money there and don't touch it and wait till the next period, then you'll get 5% interest, not on your dollar, but on your dollar and five cents, which of course turns it into a dollar and I don't know, 11 cents or something like that. If you follow the mathematical curve over these periods, at a certain point, your money will double just by you not touching it. And at a certain point, you actually will be making money on your interest from the interest that they gave you from leaving your money alone. That's compound interest, right? I love that idea, but I love it being applied to other types of resources that we have. The ability to, to create something and have it multiply just over time. I discovered that back when I um, first started freelancing, which freelancing means you're an independent journalist. And I've been doing that for several, several years, decades at this point. I just finished grad school. I was broke in Chicago, probably because of grad school. And I was doing okay as far as writing for the major publications, again, like Playboy. And when you do, usually do an article, they'll pay you per word. So you do a thousand word article, you send it to them, they publish it, and they pay you, say, a thousand dollars, which is a dollar a word, if you do the math really quick, right? Standard, good stuff, you do a bunch of those, you can make an all right living. What I discovered, though, early in my career was books. Not as in I wanted to write something big, which I did, but more the hustle, the amazing, amazing thing that works out with books. I don't have any authors in my family. Now I do. But at the time, I, I didn't. And so I didn't understand book royalties and how it worked, which are similar to you can apply it to music, which is what Candy could talk about. You can apply it to music. You can apply it to patents as far as people doing products and so forth. You can apply it to a whole, whole bunch of different things. But let's talk about books. When it comes to books, I can go ahead and write an 1,000 word article, sell it to Playboy. They cut me a check for $1,000. Yes, rent is paid. Thank you. But then they can go and reprint print that, that article in another magazine of theirs and get paid again. I don't. They can take my article and put into uh, an anthology, which is essentially a collection of articles in book form. They're doing their thing. They're getting money on that. I don't get another dime. Right? But with book royalties, I was like, wait a second. Instead of a thousand word piece, why don't I write like 15, 20,000 words on the same subject, subject that I want to get deep on? I publish the book and then every time someone buys it and reads it, I get a check. Like forever? Like forever? Like infinity? Really? Like no one, I didn't, I didn't have the tools. No one told me. <laughs> I was so bad. I was like, I've been writing. At that point, I've been a journalist for years. I was like, I would have been writing books. Are you kidding? And I, I didn't even meet my spouse yet. And I didn't have any kids yet. But I still have this vision where I'm like, all right, so I'm, I'm married, have kids. 
and I don't have, you know, and something happens to me or I pass away or whatever, then my partner and my kids are taken care of and then, their, and then their kids' kids are taken care of and they're still getting a check as long as people are buying my books. That is crazy. It's like, it's like my favorite Beyonce line, you know, at this point, my grandkids' kids' kids are rich. That line, she wasn't around back then, but that line... I heard that line on on um, on Everything Is Love, the latest album, and it just blew my mind. That's the same argument. That's the same discussion. So we're talking generational wealth for me writing twenty thousand words, not something that happens once. My point is that, and books start as a side hustle for me. So my point is that you're able to create things that multiply. You're able to create something once, and then get paid twice or more. I have 24 books out right now. About 18 of them I'm getting royalties on or I have a royalty situation. And for a handful of them, I'm getting checks every month. I don't have to, I don't have to write the books again. I can be playing with my kids and getting a check right now. That's something that came from a side hustle. So you're able to create, but that's a compound interest of putting effort into what you got. I'm not just talking about money. I want to make that extremely clear. It's not just the money aspect, but it's also the aspect as far as time. It's aspect as far as service. It's aspect as far as taking care of your community. If you started your side hustle with Bedroom Candy five years ago, because I think it started about seven years ago, right? If you started five years ago with Bedroom Candy and you're building your business, then people are going to get to know you over time. And suddenly people are going to start purchasing things from you. They're going to think about their needs and it'll go straight to you. That's the compound interest. You can't rush that. So when you stretch the timeline, when you keep your eye on your priority and you make sure everything else is built around that, then you're building for the marathon, not for the sprint. How beautiful is that? It gives me chills. That's why I love sharing this kind of stuff and getting everyone on that level because that's really where we need to be. So number one, we want to make sure that you are a proud side hustler. Take pride in it. Recognize the side hustlers among us and among your own people. It's so crucial and important. Number two is to make sure that you have, remember, your one priority, your one thing that's so important to you that you're absolutely going to do it and you need to protect it at all costs. Everything else will work out. And in fact, that one priority becomes the grounding. I am confident that I would not have the success that I had with my side hustles and with my career, particularly over the past 10 years, if I did not have my family as my priority. Otherwise, I'd be all over the place. And I've been there before. Third, as I said, my most, my most favorite, this is a favorite, my favorite one is to remember that you're worth, remember you're worth even when other people do not see your vision. We have a term back in Silicon Valley um, called pattern matching. And it's intense, but it's really important to this discussion. Let's say you're walking into, into a, a startup and you say, hey, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a coder, you know, I'm a programmer, and I would love to work with y'all. What credibility they give to you might change if you're a straight, white, nerdy male in a hoodie and torn jeans who just dropped out of an Ivy League school. They might be like, hey, you kind of look like Mark Zuckerberg. Let's give you some cred. Okay, we'll hire you. Let's see what you got. So there's a level of credibility with that so-called pattern matching that, say, if I walked in there, I wouldn't necessarily have. And in the most extreme version, it wouldn't just be, I wouldn't have the credibility. I would actually lose credibility based on my features or whatever aspects don't fit, don't fit the pattern of other people within Silicon Valley, right? It's a challenging thing. Now we're starting to see the issues coming up. And I know Silicon Valley, but it applies to other, other organizations, other fields as well. It applies to the arts. Again, it applies to even religion. It applies to anything that's been dominant by certain parties based on this pattern matching idea. Now we're starting to see challenges because now 
diversity and inclusion is a discussion. And this is well before the recent social uprising with, with George Floyd or even with the pandemic. Over the last year or two, we're starting to see these discussions about diversity and inclusion. Why is that? Part of the reason is that Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley over in Manhattan, Silicon Beach, Venice Beach over in LA, a lot of these, a lot of these places, they're not popping like they were when I lived there 10, 15 years ago. That's because the same people are in the room. When's the last time you heard of a hot app that came from here? The recent hot app is TikTok, and that's straight from China. Why isn't it popping? Because they have the same people in the room. It goes back to what Ava was talking about. So if everyone in the room looks like Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and rest in peace, Steve Jobs, you know, who all have similar personalities, <laughs> if they all look like that, then the ideas are all going to be from their point of view. They're not going to be from the point of view of the LGBTQ community. They're not going to be point, part of the point of view of the people of color communities. They're, and therefore, they're not going to be catering to those needs. And if you read the statistics from now 2020 up to 2025, there's going to be a browning and a blackening of America, not to mention the LGBTQ community. So there's a level of diversity and therefore there needs to be a level of inclusion. Why am I sharing this with you? It's because we've been asking for permission. We've been trying to get in the room. That's what Abe is saying. We've been trying to get in the room for decades, centuries. I have friends that are in their 70s and 80s. I talk with them all the time. We've been doing the same thing for decades, trying to get in the door. Heck, trying to find the building <laughs> on the map that'll get us to the room where where it happened, as they say in Hamilton. We're just trying to get to the room where it happened. And we haven't been able to do that very successfully. Now, because of the pattern match that's been happening with that, now they need us to say where the culture is going. I can understand the cultural needs of a approaching middle-aged African-American male from a certain community. You know, my, my wife, my partner can understand it from a POC viewpoint um, as a female. You know, there, there's so much diversity and so much discussion that has been part of the game. With your side hustle, you have the opportunity to do that and you do not need to wait for permission. Literally like the last third of my last book, Bring Your Worth, Level Up Your Creative Power, Value and Service to the World, is all about not asking for permission. That's like the whole thing, the whole thing. Like, this is so key and important. This goes back to the pride. This goes back to the priority. So if you know that your stuff is good and you know you can create on that level as a side hustler, even if it's just, again, I did a successful startup three hours a day. That was it for five months. That's all I did. So if you have the opportunity to do that and even just get your foot in the door as far as the direction you want to go, then do it. Because the people who are in those rooms who you're waiting for permission for, they don't know what they're doing, number one, because they're all thinking the same. And number two, you have the power to empower yourself. Even if it's a little side hustle, side hustles can become, hey, little, little acorns turn into mighty oaks. There's a reason why that saying exists. And so with the pattern match that's happening, they need your, as my friends say, they need your sauce. They need your energy. And so your opportunity, not only as far as the tools that are available, but the openness to you making a mark as a side hustler is greater than ever. That's literally why I'm here. You know, I'm not going to waste my time if it's not part of the cultural mood or if I'm talking to a community that's not going to get it. I know you get it. That's why I want to emphasize that. Along the lines of trusting your vision, even when other people don't see it, is you got to, in this, along with consistency, this might be the most major key here. You have to let people give you money. It sounds crazy, but I'm going to repeat it. Let people give you money. When, when you don't give people opportunities, to pay you, that's not you being benevolent. That's not you being humble. That's you reflecting your worth of your own self. 
that has nothing to do with them. There's a few, few levels to this. The first one is that you have to make sure that you are accessible. Make sure that you are available. A really quick story. My first major book came out. It was called Porn and Pong, How Grand Theft Auto, Tomb Raider, and Other Sexy Games Changed Our Culture. It was about video game history as well as history of pornography and sexuality in America during the course of my lifetime. And it's, I loved doing the book. I spent five years on it. I was still really young. And so it was a lot of time to spend five years on it. It came out. I put myself on book tour, bootstrapped the whole thing. You'll see a pattern with me. Bootstrapped the whole thing, did a lot of couch surfing at the different places that I lived and crashing with friends. Had a wonderful time. While I was on the road, I ended up uh, finding out that I had an email. It was from a major, uh, major news station, and they really want to interview me about porn and pop. This is a small indie book about a very niche topic, so I like went nuts. Great. Few problems with it. The first problem is that I found it in my spam folder. Right, you know spam in your email. So it's like, all right. The second problem is that the news person or news organization contacted me through my blog, which I didn't update as much as I should have and I barely checked. So it was on my blog, like, okay. The third thing, which was really a problem, is that the email or the message came a month before. I didn't see it. So I screamed, I think I literally screamed at my laptop and then I emailed them right away. I can still remember the woman's name. Like it was that scarring. And I never heard back. Didn't hear back from the organization, didn't hear back from, from the reporter. Nope. This golden opportunity was missed. Now I'm not saying that you have to be on the proverbial TikTok or proverbial Facebook and be active on there every day. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that, number one, find out where your people are. Most of my people, as far as people in the business coaching space, people that, like yourself, who want to level up your, their side hustle or start one, people who are about personal empowerment and trying to be more productive and create more while having their priorities in order, they're going to be on Twitter and they're going to be on LinkedIn. So you follow, you follow me on Twitter at Brown Damon or you follow me on LinkedIn and connect or follow me and you'll see I'm very active on there. But you won't see them on the other platforms as much. I have a presence on those platforms, but you won't see me active on them. So that's what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be that you're active on all these different things. It's just making sure you're available. There's so many wonderful entrepreneurs that I meet that do not have a website. Like even today, I don't care about social media. You still need to have some type of presence online for people to reach you and know what you're about. If you go to DamonBrown.net, you can watch my other keynotes. You can buy all my books or just check them out and read them if you end up doing the, the free stuff through Kindle. Um, you can listen to my latest interviews. You go there and you can get to know me. We don't always give that access to people, but we expect to blow up. We want to have these big sales. We want to become the proverbial millionaires, but then we don't allow our customers to reach us and we're stubborn as far as how they reach us. You can't have it both ways. So you have to have the system in place. As Jim Rohn, who um, helped teach Tony Robbins back in the day, I'm a big fan of him. His, his name is uh, Jim Rohn. It's J-I-M-R-O-H-N. Jim Rohn said that if you can't handle $5, then how are you gonna handle 5 million? In other words, you need to have your systems in place. This is the time to do it. It's actually, it's always the time to do it. There's never a bad time to get your system tighter. So letting people give you money the number one thing is to actually make yourself accessible. The second thing is to push the ratio so that it's at least 90% of your time is spent serving and 10% or less is spent selling. 90% maybe more spent serving, serving the people you want to serve, your community, your tribe, whatever you want to call it, and then 10% selling. Now, when I say serving, I really mean listening. You shouldn't be talking that much. You should be listening because then they'll tell you where you're supposed to go. And then if you go where they, where they say they need you to be, then you don't need to sell anything. They'll just be like, okay, that sounds great. How much is it? Great. Okay. How, where can I buy it? Again, back to the access. That leads to the last point as far as letting people give you money is that you have to listen to them and then actually give them levels to go. You always have to give your tribe places to go, to go further with you. 
because they're always wanna go, wanting to go further. When I uh, came out with uh, the Bike Test Entrepreneur about my experiences with Cuddler and So Quotable, it became a bestseller. I was not expecting that. And that got me on the road and really started my speaking career. And I started traveling the country, even started to go overseas. And I was doing three or four of these keynotes and the same thing would happen. We'd have the keynote, we'd have the Q&A, and then someone afterwards, you know, I'd be signing their book and like, Damon, hey, I loved your keynote. I loved your Q&A. Thank you for answering my question when I asked it from the audience. Um, I have more questions that are more kind of detailed. Um, did you want to grab a coffee or a drink or something? And I'd be like, well, I guess so. Um, and they're like, well, no, not like that. Just I'm, I, I want to go a little bit deeper. And I'm like, oh, okay. And what I would say those first few times is that I'd be like, well, drop me a line, drop me an email, and I have a column with Inc. Magazine and so forth. Um, I'll go ahead and forward you to my columns. I'll probably address some of the stuff you're talking about. Excuse me. But thank you for coming through, and, and I'll let you know when the next book comes. I think that was literally what I was saying. Those that are much savvier than me probably understand what was going on. It took me a while. But again, after the third or fourth keynote like that, it happened again. And again, the same thing happened. And then they were like, well, no, like, like I want to ask like some deeper questions, not take you out for a drink, but some deeper questions. And like, do you coach or anything like that? And I was like, well, it depends on what you need. And they're like, oh, okay, so how much do you charge? And you never say you don't know. And I was like, well, how about this? How about, um, let me get your email. And then by the end of the day, uh, I'll, I'll email you and, and we'll talk about some things. That's what I did. And sure enough, by the end of the day, I'm emailing them. And I think I charged $50 an hour. Kind of did some research online, talked to some people I know. I'm like, I don't know. So don't feel bad if you're not sure what to charge or how it works, because a lot of us are trying to figure things out. And I, and I emailed them and they're like, great, sounds good. And we ended up meeting at a coffee shop. They bought me a coffee. We are talking about things based on the framework I talk about in The Bite Size Entrepreneur, but specific to them. They said, thank you very much. And they gave me a check for 50 bucks. And I was like, oh, okay. Now in 2020, my business coaching, and now at this point I've coached hundreds of people. My business coaching is now a major part of my business financially, but also a part of how I serve. But I wasn't planning on that. Again, my background is writing. I plan on writing books and then just, everything's in a book, you don't need to talk to me. And the public speaking called me and then it went on from there. The thing is, is that people were telling me, my community, my tribe was telling me all along where I was supposed to go, where they were going. I, we need this statement. And I wasn't hearing them because I was trying to serve them in a certain way, right? It's like having a kid over here and someone's really asking for this other kit and you keep focusing on this. At a certain point, either you're gonna get frustrated or they're gonna leave. So you have to give them levels to go to and different levels to invest. Not just financially, but time-wise. A simple example would be with my stuff where at uh, inkdamonbrown.com, you can read my ink column. It's free. I get paid for it, but it's, it's free to you. So you can read it. I want something deeper. Cool, why don't you come to my website and and you can buy some of my books. They're like 20 or $30. Cool, I want something more. Cool, well, why don't you go to my boot camp and then do the boot camp? it's a few hundred dollars and it goes up from there, but it has some interactive videos and videos from other people as far as how to start your startup and as well as how to do your, your side hustle, et cetera. Or oh, I want something deeper. Well, we can do some one-on-one -on -one coaching. Why well, I want something deeper. Or well, I can come keynote at your organization. You see what I mean? Like it wasn't like side hustles began as just this, you know, this stack of things. It's rather they started as something small. I'm going to write a book and became, I'm going to go keynote conferences. But that's based on the feedback and of that 90% serving versus 10% selling. If it was the other way around, I'd just be out here trying to hustle books, which doesn't make any sense because people and I can serve on so many different other ways. That's the beauty of letting people give you money because if you let them give you money, then they will show you in the ways that you can serve them. And of course, you can go ahead and have the benefit of not only having the financial security, but also being able to serve your community and make it a better community at the level that they need to be. So those are the three. You end up having one, 
remembering that you should be a proud side hustler. You know, you, you probably come from this lineage. If you don't come from this lineage, you have people around you who are side hustling. Lean on them. Understand that you understand some of this game already. And you're actually ahead of the curve based on probably the majority of America. So that's one. Number two is to remember your priority, your one big rock. Remember the rock analogy. If you feel lost, what's your big rock? If you're just starting your side hustle, establish your big rock now. If you're already into it, then remember what your big rock is. Sit down and write it down if you have to. But it won't take it that long because we all have one big rock. We don't have multiple rocks. We have one priority. Try to have that level of honesty with yourself. Lastly, and again, my personal favorite, remember your worth even when other people don't understand your vision. The time to wait for permission is done. And in fact, the people that can so-called empower you, they're not in a position to empower you, particularly during the pandemic and all that stuff going on. Nobody knows what they're doing. So you're just as qualified as everybody else, which is brilliant and strong and great. One of my favorite African proverbs is that history is always told from the perspective of the hunter, not from the lion. In other words, the people in power, the people that end up surviving, if, if that's right, the right term for it, they're always the ones that dictate what's hot and what's not. But that's a biased history. With you doing side hustles outside of the traditional system, you paving your own way, you have the opportunity to create your own story. You are writing your own story. And therefore, you're able to transform yourself transform your community, and ideally, eventually, transform the world. Thank you.